Welcome to the High Rise Podcast, presented by Headset, the leading data and analytics company for the cannabis industry. Welcome back to the High Rise, a laid back data back conversation where we talk all things cannabis from US MSOs to Canadian LPs, products and market analysis through the lens of data. My name is Cy Scott with Headset, and I am joined as always by Emily Paxia of Poseidon. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the High Rise. And a few weeks ago, um, we had a good conversation about Nevada consumption lounges, particularly the new license structure that was coming out. Pretty exciting uh, new framework that we really hadn't seen before. And we thought, well, we got to invite a couple of cool people here that know a lot more than us to chat about it. So I'd like to welcome Sarah Stewart, CEO and co-founder of Ritual Cannabis Hospitality, and Scott Rutledge, partner at Argentum Partners and a founder of Reset Consulting, which is providing services to cannabis consumption lounges. Thanks for joining today, both of you. Thanks for having us. Thank you. Happy to be here. Yeah. So let's start, Sarah, with you and, and your background and, and learn a bit more about Ritual Cannabis Hospitality, how you got into this uh, space and, and, and what you're thinking about when it comes to consumption lounges. Yes, <clears throat> that's pretty much what I do is only think about consumption lounges. Um, but I have been in hospitality for about 15 years now. My first start in cannabis was actually through a hospitality lens. So I learned metric from a restaurant standpoint, which was interesting. I have since uh, operated two cannabis lounges now in two different states. They had two totally different concepts and ran totally differently. So it was really interesting to see. And I've also started a uh, consulting company that is basically helping license holders come online and create these new kinds of concepts in the cannabis industry, uh, facing a lot of the hurdles and challenges that come along with it from operations to development to profitability. You know, if, if you run several cannabis retail stores right now, you don't really understand the whole hospitality driven model that these lounges are going to require. So a lot of what we do is just making sure that people are coming into this space educated, informed and uh, looking for success. Fantastic. Thanks, Sarah. And Scott, uh, how about you? How did you get involved in, in the consumption lounge portion of the cannabis space? So a slightly different path than Sarah's. Um, I, I moved to Nevada in 2004. I'm, I'm based in Las Vegas. Uh, and I moved here in 2004 to legalize weed. So we were unsuccessful in that first uh, attempt. I guess it was the second attempt that, it, that had uh, taken place. Um, in fact, we were so unsuccessful. Jay Leno made a joke about it on the Tonight Show. I then stepped back from cannabis advocacy work, spent uh, the better part of a decade doing environmental advocacy work here in Nevada, took a little time off, worked for a member of Congress. And while working for Congresswoman Dina Titus back in 2014, she wanted to do what she could to support the cannabis industry that was beginning to open up in Nevada based on our 2013 medical laws that had been passed. We spent a lot of time meeting with some of the best operators at the time in parts of California, Colorado, and Arizona for medical cannabis. And that's really what reintroduced me to the industry and to the movement. I was then hired to manage the legalization campaign in 2016. Upon the successful uh, campaign, I parlayed that into a practice in government affairs, regulatory affairs. And over the last five years, I've been working on the policy and regulatory structure of cannabis lounges for Nevada. We looked at what other states had done, what we thought worked and would be a good thing to borrow from, things that we didn't like and didn't want to repeat those same challenges here. And um, in 2021, I worked with our state speaker, uh, not speaker then, but speaker now, Assemblyman Steve, and Steve Yeager on our cannabis lounge legislation. Prior to that, I worked with the city of Las Vegas to pass their ordinance, help draft that. So I've been working on writing the theme for the past four years. And so taking the next step uh, with my partner, Chris Laporte, in actually in help operate lounges here in Nevada uh, and working with other clients, similar to some of the, the work that Sarah's company does. And in fact, will likely work with Sarah on some projects I'm certain in the future. In fact, one, one thing Sarah didn't mention in her introduction was that she, she was actually one of our uh, experts, I guess we'll just say experts who, who provided testimony to our state legislature in 2021. She was the first person I thought to call after being aware of the work that she had done in this space. 
to provide some uh, some testimony that helped us get our bill passed in 2021. So thanks again for for helping us out with that, Sarah. Um, That's the reason why they have are one of a kind. <laughs> That's we the reason why they have lounges in Nevada in general, I'm convinced. Um, <laughs> so thank you for pushing the envelope and making sure that we actually have this, you know, conversation to talk about right now. It's been my pleasure. <laughs> well, and I'd like to thank you both because I think anybody who listens to the podcast knows that I get on my soapbox and preach about how I don't think cannabis should live in a silo and it should be integrated into an experiential setting, just like anything else. And and I remember actually the three of us having a conversation at Brooklyn Bowl in Las Vegas during the Krungbin show about how excited we were <laughs> for this to come. And I think that this is this is Nevada is the tip of the spear, right? Nevada, especially Las Vegas, known for hospitality. It's the you know, one of the tent poles of our country in terms of having a standout uh, experience. And, you know, I've been based in San Francisco since 2011. We've had lounges, so to speak, here. But the way for anyone who's in a state or a place where you don't have any access to a lounge, the way these have existed have substantially just been a part of a store. And it's sometimes sequestered off to a back room or sometimes it's integrated right into the store. And it was always meant to be a place to support people to consume cannabis, especially this actually comes up as an important equity issue on the very fundamental level, because some people cannot consume cannabis depending on where they're living. And it, it does put housing at jeopardy. So having a safe consumption space and a, a community around this has been important. But what I'm excited about is what Scott and Sarah are going to be talking about today, which is where this can really go next and where we can see the imagination take us and, and really have a hospitality experience around this. So I don't know, Sarah, do you mind kind of jumping in with just with your rich background of having participated in events and experiences? How do you envision this is going to roll out? And what do you think? And Scott, I loved what you said, because another thing I always think about is like, we have things we can draw from now, we don't have to create these laws in a, in a vacuum. And we can, in this instance, draw from other sectors such as, you know, alcohol, wine and spirits and how that's been dealt with in every range from wine tasting experiences through to bars and restaurants. So I'd love to hear from you guys about how you think about this. And Sarah, if you would want to kick it off and then we'll bounce to Scott. Yeah, I actually love what you said first about the San Francisco lounges, because they are like some of the first that we've ever seen to exist. Quite frankly, though, they they really were just like working with very limited regs at the time when these started to come about. So people often think of a lounge and that's the first thing that they think of. But I'm trying to shift that focus pretty heavily because even those types of lounges are very retail focused in every sense of the way. You know, you're still picking up product at a, at a counter, essentially, and then you're bringing it to this space where you can like sit down and consume. But this new era of, I guess, lounges that are coming are like control based first. I always say control is the name of the game for us, where we are doing everything for you to make sure you have the best experience. We're, you know, administering your concentrates for you on low temperature settings with, you know, perfectly filled bongs that have, you know, just the right temp temperatures and ice and those little things, especially if you go to maybe I'll order like a cup of coffee and a sativa pre-roll at the same time, you have to know, your, your employees have to know to call some of those things out to guests. If that's a, an experience they've never had before, we have to be able to make sure that it's a good one and that they want to come back. And also with those lounges that you see a lot in San Fran, you know, they're working on very low revenue because they don't have the ability to have second or third offerings for, you know, entertainment based models. My biggest focus is food and beverage in this setting because it is a profitable business model, maybe not as profitable as cannabis, but it is a profitable experience that people are used to. It's a familiar environment. And now we're kind of normalizing this space with more revenue streams, more opportunities for these companies to make money and providing them more of an opportunity to bring in the masses with, you know, normalized environments that they're familiar with, uh, as opposed to feeling like it's maybe like a glorified smoking lounge of sorts. 
And I think what you just said, too, about the the way this can be, this is a fun experience. It's an interesting experience. It's also educational and informative. And, you know, I, I remember when I was in media consulting, CBS just started crushing it with their, their programming because they did a lot of market testing in Las Vegas. And what Las Vegas represents is kind of the cross set section of the United States. You get every type of citizen passing through there. And I think if we can use this as a platform, and not just Las Vegas, there's Reno, there's Tahoe, there's all these great places across Nevada. And so I think it's a great place to be able to reach a broad consumer base and maybe help to socialize, like exactly what you're talking about. How does Sativa potentially interact with a, a caffeinated beverage versus something else? So just little things like that, I think will really matter in this environment. Yeah. And even with Scott, you know, like that's really the big, one of the biggest things that we connected on is like every other state that's coming online right now is still saying no food. You know, they're taking the California model of no food and beverage, and they're not even looking into it. They're not even really looking at, you know, food and beverage as an overconsumption protocol, sugars, amino acids, caffeine, very helpful in this environment, but not to just mention, you know, the, the, the revenue and things like we were mentioning. So Scott and I had so many early on conversations about what does a cannabis lounge look like and how do we change that? in Nevada in particular. And that's something that I really commend him on is that, you know, the lounge regs in Nevada are, in my opinion, some of the most progressive and the best looking that we've seen so far, because these are going to be old food and beverage based establishments that we're taking over that are going to look and feel like hospitality and not kind of like, you know, forced into a retail environment like every other state is running into. So and I give Scott a lot of credit for that because he really pushed for that kind of normalization in Vegas. Yeah. And I wanted to ask a, a bit about that, uh, Scott, in your experience, like how did that come about? Was that a hard thing to push through? Because it, it does seem so intuitive in so many ways, Sarah, for all those reasons you you laid out, yet we don't see this model anywhere else. And anytime there, there's a, a, a market that's kind of the first mover doing something a little bit different and can't point to others, I would imagine it's a, a harder thing to convince people of. Was it pretty easy? Was it, was it difficult? Did you have to you know, open a lot of eyes with this whole idea of these are independent from retail? So in Nevada, the idea of having a place for specifically in Southern Nevada, tourists to consume cannabis, which we made legal and began first sell at midnight on July 1, 2017. But we never solved for where are they supposed to consume this? You can't consume it at the retail store you purchased it from. Um, so folks were taking it back to their hotels and, you know, the, the existing cannabis lounges today in Southern Nevada are parking garages, hotel balconies. You know, it's the area you stand over kind of out of the way, out of the view of hotel security or what have you. And one of the reasons why I think we were able to pass the legislation we did in 21 as I will say easily as we did is because it was a conversation that began in 2017 at a, at a local level, you know, whether it was the Clark County Commission considering it through their Green Ribbon panel or the city of Las Vegas taking this on and actually passing an ordinance that uh, we helped write and lobby in 2019. But the state actually was smart for stepping in and saying, wait, time out. We actually would like to license these at the state level, because otherwise you end up in a situation where, like in California, you have a, a, a specific use being added to an existing license type that wasn't designed to support that use, i.e. retail stores. And so we were able to take a pause, work with both uh, a new entity, the Cannabis Compliance Board, which was stood up in the summer of 2020, that entity gave us now a new oversight and new opportunity for new license types. And being able to have a regulatory authority focused just on cannabis in Nevada was a, a, a tremendous benefit to the industry. Um, it certainly hasn't been without its challenges, uh, ask any operator in Nevada, but we had a place for regulations to be promulgated once we passed a bill. During the legislative process in 21, the, I, I say it was the least controversial controversy that the state has ever addressed because you are talking about cannabis. Uh, you do have members of the legislature who have their concerns. There were a lot of issues we had to address during the session, uh, such as public safety, public health. A lot of concerns about cannabis DUI came up. And so 
in the process of drafting the legislation, you know, Emily mentioned earlier how we could look to other industries like alcohol and go, well, how did they address this? Uh, one good example in, in our bill in Nevada was that we actually took the, the Nevada's dram shop laws, um, which uh, address the issue of liability for alcohol consumption and serving at bars and restaurants. And we took that language and we put it into our cannabis lounge legislation and literally just changed the words alcohol to cannabis. And then, you know, with the legislative attorneys made a few other adjustments. But that was one example of borrowing from something that existed and then also saying, by the way, we need to do it better. That's also where you have to rely on other agencies or entities to support that, i.e., the regulatory body, and then now local jurisdictions in the development of their ordinances, getting the left hand to talk to the right hand in government can be very, very challenging. And you often find yourself saying the same thing for multiple years because you're re-explaining to new audiences. That being said, we've been able to get, I think, at the county level and the city level, some connectivity between the bill that we passed, the regulations we promulgated, and now how that shows up in these ordinances. So it's it's a lengthy process. For someone like me, it's the perfect type of work because it really hits every level of government. And I nerd out about this stuff because one, when you can actually do it right on the front end, then folks like Sarah who are have that operational expertise can come in and show a business how to create a successful business right? Based on the freedom that we provided in those regulations. So much of what we said was we always looked at it through the lens of how can we make this a business decision or choice versus a regulatory requirement? Not to say that the regulations in Nevada aren't very, they are very, very strict when it comes to indoor air quality, single serve products, and how we're going to do that. But we're also giving businesses the flexibility so that you know, you balance the cost of, of meeting those regulatory requirements with the opportunity to generate multiple revenue streams. Yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense. With with this legislation uh, for the independent lounges, given you kind of, you're talking about modeling it off of um, alcohol, are there going to be uh, the same kind of restrictions on location? Are, they, are these locations going to be kind of off the beaten path or is there like a, a, a potential to see them in kind of more trafficked areas like you might a bar kind of on, on Main Street? Right. Well, the retail stores that are allowed to and 20 retail stores in Nevada did did apply for a lounge uh, license. Um, we thought there might be more, but but it's funny when, when we actually during the session, we're trying to figure out how many independent licenses which would be those not attached to retail stores we should allow for, we had to start with a number somewhere to meet sort of the legislative concerns about, you know, are we going to have a cap on these? Will there be hundreds of them? Will there be 10 of them? So we said, well, let's start with the number 20. We completely guessed that number. It was an arbitrary number. We said, we assume there'll be, let's say, 20 retail stores that will want a lounge license. Therefore, we'll need to allow for 20 independence, half of those need to be social equity ownership groups. And wouldn't you know, when the state, uh, the CCB, Cannabis Compliance Board, opened up their application process, they said, well, w- when, when that closed, there were exactly 20 retail stores that had requested the opportunity to open up a lounge. And so therefore, we somehow guessed it right. In terms of the locations, those 20 retail stores, the ones uh, that applied, most of them are are around tourist areas in Southern Nevada. Um, There was one in Washoe Valley um, and another in Story County, uh, both up north, two in Pahrump, which is about an hour north of Las Vegas. And then the other 36 licenses will exist in and around uh, the Las Vegas tourism corridor. So this truly is going to be a Southern Nevada experiment, but I would say a lot of those locations a couple, in fact, are right near the strip. Others are, aren't that far away from the strip. So I don't think these are being relegated to places people don't go. Um, I do think the independents will have a little more of a challenge in certain parts of the valley because they do have to meet more stringent setback requirements than existing retail stores had to. That being said, I do think there are plenty of good locations 
Uh, we may inevitably see some clustering the same way that you go down to a, a district in your city where there may be four or five, 10 bars. We may see four or five of these lounges clustered together. And the idea that they're walkable and that you could bar hop, as it were, between concepts and venues is also an exciting opportunity in front of us. Yeah, very cool. And and I want to talk about the concepts. Uh, it's, a, it's a great segue. So, Sarah, maybe this is a, a great question for you with your kind of hospitality background, like, are, are they all going to look uh, the same? Are they going to look quite different? Do you think people are going to find like one model and just go with it? Like, what does the world look like in the, in the future when these, these independents are open and I, I go to uh, Nevada and I start visiting them? Well, I guess, honestly, first and foremost, uh, for transparency purposes, it's really going to depend on funding. It's really going to depend on what it's going to cost to build out these places. And for some people, that's going to be a challenge alone. If you're purchasing a space that doesn't have a commercial kitchen, your concept now has to have, you know, build out costs for a a kitchen space, which is going to be very costly. So in terms of concept, I guess it really just depends on what people are, you know, looking at. And I've been saying to my clients often is hospitality first, cannabis second, what's your business model? And if you have one that exists without cannabis, it is going to also exist with cannabis. Um, And, you know, I don't think anyone's getting this creative in Nevada just yet, but there are some really interesting ways we could see these lounges play out aside from just the traditional restaurant driven concept or nightclub driven concept, or maybe even a music venue driven concept. That's one that I'm really excited about personally. But, you know, early on, we talked about like maybe going to a barber shop and being able to actually like consume cannabis while getting your hair cut. You know, that could exist in time. Or what about a movie theater? You know, every movie theater in the country has a liquor license. How many people get drunk at the movies? I'm guessing very little. (laughs) So to have high ceilings, to have ventilation already, and to have a space with munchies and and a snack stand, like to me, a movie theater is like a no brainer. But I don't think people are thinking that way yet because hospitality is not the way that retail operators have thought, you know, the last 10, 20 years that they've been doing this. And so it's like getting them to think differently is like really the biggest challenge of all of this. It is funny how people get stuck in these in these constructs about how they think about it. I couldn't agree with you more about the movies, obviously. And then I think about other experiential things that go down in in Southern Nevada, like the Meow Wolf thing that opened up and like Escape the Room type thing. I mean, there's so many things that could be also cannabis instead instead of or however we want to think about it but I think it's a really good point would you guys mind kind of setting a little bit of a a clarity point for the listeners about kind of what the regulations do dictate in in Nevada is it like can you have indoor outdoor space um what form form factors are currently allowed just anything else like that Scott I think this is a question for you are we still on track to an April opening month for this maybe I would say I'd like to see the first couple of these open in the county and possibly the city this spring. One of the the clients Reset is working with, we think we're on on path to be open by April, assuming that the county's ordinance, which uh, I'm actually going to that hearing tomorrow morning, is approved um, without any challenges. Um, And we've already done the upfront work and met with those commissioners. And there's been a public input process so far. Tomorrow will be the public hearing. I would say that, you know, April seems reasonable. As far as what could your listeners expect in terms of the the what's allowed? So we, a few things that I think are important for that that business flexibility we talked about is the state law does allow for consumption to occur outdoors as long as it's not visible from a public space, like say a sidewalk or the road. Um, so if you do have a rooftop, you're just not going to be able to see the folks up on the rooftop consuming, they'll need to be behind either some sort of one-way glass or, uh, you know, maybe some sort of anything to block the view of seeing people actually consume cannabis. We don't want to see that, the, okay? <laughs> which is, you don't want to see that, right? I mean, it's crazy. People are walking around literally on the sidewalks in the resort corridor smoking cannabis every day. And yet we have to hide it when we talk about a regulated licensed business. So whatever, we will do that because 
that is what we must do. You know, the idea of like, how do you manage overconsumption, right? If you go to a retail store attached lounge in California today, my experience in going to the ones both in San Francisco and in LA have been, you go in, you buy as much cannabis as you're allowed to buy as a retail customer. There's no limits on the amount you can purchase. You consume what you want. You take the rest home. Some of the product offerings in those venues, like the beverages are single serve, but generally there's just It was designed as a retail add-on, not as a separate license type. So when we in Nevada said, what would it look like to make a lounge look, how, what do you do when you go to a bar? You buy a drink, right? You consume it and then you order another one. So we have what's called single use products in Nevada, as well as ready to consume. The single use addresses the existing market, the existing SKUs, because we didn't want to, right? make it so that products available today in the marketplace couldn't be sold in those venues. So think pre-rolls or individual beverages, other things like that. But from a ready to consume thought, we also thought it would be nice if you could buy, have lounges buy product in bulk, say flour, and not have to package it, right? The, the amount of unnecessary packaging in this industry makes me nuts. As I said earlier, I, you know what, my background is in environmental advocacy. It's We are a very wasteful industry because of the packaging requirements. So if you know that you have a venue that's 21 and up and you go in and you order some flour and maybe you're there with three or four friends and you all want to use different devices. And I know Sarah and I have talked about that and it's, it was a great opportunity for these people to come into these venues and try something they haven't used before or to use like a really nice version of a thing, right? Whether it be a bong or a vaporizer. So now your server is going to bring out this product and let's say in your party, you're each going to try different consumption methods, right? Well, that shouldn't have to show up in individual packages. It's loose flour. Maybe you want to serve it on a really nice, in a really nice presentation. Maybe you want the person that's serving you, that's educating you. Also, they're going to roll that for you, right? And they're going to have a conversation with you as it's happening. Or the perfectly packed bowl. I think you mentioned that, Sarah. It's like these little nice touches, right? That white glove service with the education could make an experience that maybe for a novice consumer goes from being maybe a little scary or uncertain to very comforting. This is a chance, by the way, for the cannabis industry to do something way better than the alcohol industry, which is to be able to have conversations with every consumer about the products they're buying, that they're trying potentially for the first time and the effects it can have on them. From a data collection side of things, the ability to real time collect that data through observation and potentially self-reporting and using that to improve on product offerings and things like that. So back to the point though, of what kind of things can you expect in addition to maybe being able to smoke your favorite flower product uh, outdoors is also the idea of this ready to consume product, uh, i.e. cannabis cocktails or food, right? We all know that edibles hit differently. The delay is there, but I think there's also in the same way that if you go to dinner and drink wine, while you will feel the effects of that wine at dinner, you also feel it after dinner, right? Cannabis can be the same way. Maybe you smoke some flour with your meal that is infused, or maybe you choose to just have an infused dining experience. It will be incumbent though on these operators because of the public safety issues to to let these these guests know, and perhaps it starts with, again, something Sarah told me two years ago, reservations are so key, right? So if we can find out more about who's coming in and make that reservation and understand that, hey, ahead of time, you might not drive to our venue. Now, in Southern Nevada, that's easier because a lot of people are used to not running cars. It's a lot of tourists using rideshare cabs, et cetera. But we do need to solve for that issue of people that are driving under the influence, more so the novice consumer who doesn't have that experience with cannabis. So I do think that if you are coming to Las Vegas to go to a lounge in the spring and and ask you some questions, maybe you weren't thinking they would ask. I would say go with it, because what we're trying to do, what we will be trying to do as an industry, as operators, is learn as much as we can about how to do this right. And we would ask that our guests play along with that because if they can go along with what we're trying to do on the front end and improve the experience for everyone, we can prove that not only is this a successful business model, but we likely will see more of these in other communities and other states. But Vegas has the world watching 
and we really want to get it right. And I, I kind of want to add to into that. Correct me if I'm wrong, Scott, but I think this is going to help the way that the lounges look in Nevada. I think it's going to help separate the retailers from the lounges because you can't really bring products home from a lounge. You know, I, I correct. Can't... You have to consume there just like correct. a bar. And so now, if you didn't win a lounge license, or if you are just a retailer, you're not really looking at that as a competitor. If people are still consuming in in public or at home or whatever that is, they're still coming to your retail shop to buy products. Now it's just like a new type of offering. And and I think that that's really appealing to new states as well to look at that model because they're no longer looking at lounges as competition, but as just like the liquor st- store versus the bar concept. Those don't really compete. One is for on-site and the other is for like take home. That's exactly right, Sarah. That's exactly right. This is not competition to existing retail. It is a new offering in this space. And look, retailers generally in a lot of markets are vertically integrated, right? And if they're trying to figure out what kind of products they might want to offer in the future, where better than to have lounges where, again, you can collect that that feedback and go, you know what? We found that people really gravitated towards this versus this. And now all of a sudden you're, you're investing money in a product that has been product tested, if you will, right? I don't know. I, I think there's a lot of things long-term that these these types of businesses will provide greater benefit to the entire ecosystem of cannabis business versus just being this novelty idea. Not to say that these can't be extraordinarily fun, creative, and just, just be what they need to be because cannabis consumers deserve to have a place to socially consume together. But there's a lot we can learn from this to, to the benefit of everyone in the industry. Again, if we do this right. And I think we will. Yeah, and when you, do when you say right. data collection, I mean, that's you know, music to my ears. I love the idea of this, um, you know, when you go to a dispensary or retailer and, and you're you're getting suggestions and the bud tender, you know, may say, okay, this this will help you with sleep or this one will keep you awake or, you know, these different strains or different products. And, uh, you know, you, you take it home and you try it and maybe it, it does, maybe it doesn't. But this is like a real time kind of feedback loop where, you know, you can you can make the suggestion and then get that information back. Like, how is everybody doing? Like everyone's asleep on the couch, you know, at the uh, consumption lounge or they're maybe, you know, all, all laughing or whatever. You can get that data right then and, and see that, you know, impact, which is even better than kind of coming back and self-reporting when you go back to the store for the next t- purchase and it's, you know, two, three, four weeks, whatever it is. And you're like, oh yeah, talk, maybe talking to a different bud tender, you, you can't close the loop like you can at a consumption lounge. So that's, that's huge. Do you think, um, you, you know, you mentioned, Sarah, like on-site versus take-home. Do you think we're going to see some product innovation over time? You know, maybe not day one, but do you think that there's going to be things that that are just better suited to on-site versus take-home and brands kind of positioning around that? Oh, yes. I mean, I am not a huge fan of the edible market in lounges. I just don't feel like it's a very unique experience. We've all probably taken an edible in our favorite restaurant and there's not a real need to have a lounge space for that. But the low dose fast acting beverage market is like so exciting for this space. And like you said earlier, you know, like a lot of people have sold weed to people, but not many have watched them consume those products in front of their face, you know, for the first time. So like, this is what we're seeing. And for us, it's all about making sure that the products match the experience. And it's not even on the cannabis side as much as it's on sometimes the device side of things. Uh, A good example is like, you know, the store in Bickle, I think it's called the Volcanoes. Those are great devices. Everybody really likes them, but they're huge and they're clunky and they have a cord. I can't have anything that has a cord if I'm bringing it to a table, you know, to be plugged in while there's also food and drinks and a whole new like mess on the table with grinders, ashtrays, lighters. So the innovation on the, you know, consumption side for products and high-end devices is also like really coming, you know, alive. And I'm trying to push the envelope and talk to these ancillary providers because, you know, they're talking about cleaning products, you know, at home every two weeks. And I'm hitting them up like, hey, I'm supposed to clean this product 10 times a day, every single day in ISO, you know, like, are these going to be sustainable for, for the long run? So it is more than just the cannabis products as well. It's the ancillary industry that's going to have to, you know, follow up with that too. 
I mean, to that end, are you planning on having specific training modules for the people working in the lounges so that they can really be holding a certain standard of information sharing? Yes. And that's kind of something that I learned early on in Lowell was, you know, we were seeing like eight to 10 pass outs a week sometimes from not controlling the environment in the same way that we should. If someone's getting a Puffco, I'm not going to allow them to choose their own temperature setting anymore. I'm going to give them low temp, tasty, good experience so that they're not coughing up a lung. And now they might be running to the bathroom to throw up because they had an unpleasant table side experience. So it is totally about control. And so now my servers have to know the cannabis products, the effects, the terpenes, but the products alongside of that with coffees, like we were saying, and then also device, you know, like if you're pouring bong water back in the back of house to come out to a new table, you have to know the perfect level of water that is needed to fill a bong and, you know, additional things. You need to know you have a, a banger. You need to know everything that goes with it. And so it's like definitely more than cannabis and food at this point. It's like device service. It sure is. Okay. I can't wait. This is going to be such a tremendous shift in our experience. Yeah. I know. And as these, these open up, given your, your experience, Scott, and just getting this across the line and, and all the challenges and, and the amount of time uh, and that story they had to repeat over and over again, are you going to go out and get this done in other places? Are we going to see this in California next or New York? I mean, there's part of me that wants to see us get this done correctly in, in Nevada, in Las Vegas and, and focus there. It's not to say that other states like New Jersey, New York, uh, California, who have these laws and are going to allow these businesses to to open up. I think the New Jersey rules that have come out are terrible. I I, I think you know I know Sarah has written about it. I've seen some of her posts. I I've talked to other people, and look, it's hard for me to go out and 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 evangelize about what we did in Nevada and why it's so awesome why it's going to be great when we haven't actually done it yet. So ask me that question in a year, Cy, because if we do what I think we can do over the course of next year, then absolutely, I'd be happy to, to have those conversations in other markets about with those regulators, et cetera, about why it worked in Nevada. But, you know, every state, as we know, in this industry has the best rules and the best, you know, product and the best operators and all of that. And, we're going to see how that plays out. You know, Emily mentioned earlier that, you know, Las Vegas, because of the tourism, right, we do have a chance to see how people from different parts of the country, whether they have legal cannabis or not, respond to this, right? But it's also where there's an immense amount of pressure, as I see it, for our operators, for the Sarah Stewarts of the world to really figure out how to get not just the right concepts in place, but that people are trained properly on every aspect of these businesses, because there is an awesome responsibility that comes with creating these new opportunities is not something that is lost on me. I probably had a panic attack or two after legalizing cannabis in 16, because I was very concerned about what if we're wrong? What if all of these people come to Las Vegas and start buying legal cannabis and act even crazier than they already do. Well, it turns out that Las Vegas needed a, a heavy dose of cannabis to kind of chill out because this place is crazy. You know, I, I am not someone that goes out to clubs. Um, I do go to bars occasionally. Mostly I just go out to eat and I hang with my friends and I don't go out as much as you would see tourists do here. And I will say that I hear from my friends in law enforcement and other places that cannabis is not a problem here. So now we're going to say, cool, let's give them a place to use it publicly, socially in a licensed regulated way. But, you know, I have concerns about what people are going to show up to Las Vegas with that anything goes attitude and what they're going to try to pull off in some of these venues. So if we figure it out here, and I know we will, then I think it is very transferable to other markets because we're dealing with a lot of challenges as much as we have those opportunities. Very much paving the way for something unique and, and novel uh, in the U.S. cannabis experience and, and really excited to see how this plays out. Sarah, where can people learn more about Ritual Cannabis Hospitality and, and what you're up to? Ritualteam.com 
uh, we'll show a little bit more about what we're up to. My Instagram is Miss Sarah Stu. I do a lot of my personal consulting work through that as well. And uh, also on Instagram at Ritual Cannabis Hospitality. Great. We'll put links in the show notes for sure. And Scott, how about uh, with Reset Consulting or Argentum Partners? Probably the easiest way is to find me on LinkedIn. That's uh, the websites uh, for both companies. I just, I don't know. Websites to me seem like such a antiquated thing. So I would say find me on LinkedIn. Also, my, uh, my co-founder and business partner, Chris Laporte, is very active on LinkedIn. And you can reach out to him. But um, yeah, the other place you'll be able to find me is in our lounge that uh, we'll be partnered with Thrive Dispensary on. Uh, we'll be opening that venue up in April if everything goes well. Though I'll probably be up in Carson City at the legislature in most of April and May, trying to continue to improve on our cannabis laws. So you might not find me in my my lounge until June. Busiest things will will likely be, but but definitely we will let you guys know. We'd love to have you come do a show from the venue in the future. I think that would be super cool. Maybe we can bring get the team back together and and revisit this conversation and smoke some weed while we do it. Love it. Yeah, yeah, we're definitely going to do that. So April, May, June, whenever whenever that opens up, we're there. Don't really need too many excuses to get out, but uh, we'll we'll take it. So, <laughs> thanks so much, uh, both of you, for joining. And really, really exciting stuff. And and can't wait to see all this as it plays out in person. Thank thanks, you. Guys. Thanks for listening to the High Rise Podcast presented by Headset. For more information on Headset, visit headset.io.